right. All right, um, so thank you again for joining us today. And uh, can you just briefly introduce yourself and tell us what brought you to your current work and what you do now? Yes, so my name is Jelani Greenidge, and um, I like to say that I am a uh, communicator extraordinaire uh, or like a media renaissance guy. So by that, I mean, I have a bunch of jobs. I have a lot of small jobs that together make one decent job. Uh, so first, my day job. I work um, as what most people would say a religion correspondent, um, but for an actual church denomination. My, my job title is actually missional storyteller. So I do a lot of um, storytelling articles uh, that are faith-based in um, just telling the different stories of what uh, people in our church denomination are about and what they're doing and kind of digging into the story of God in their life. Um, but aside from that, I also um, am a worship leader and a hip hop uh, producer and lyricist and a DJ. And I also uh, dabble a little bit in stand up comedy. Um, and so and I also write and kind of do other other kind of multimedia related stuff. So I try to keep my hands in a lot of different things. And they're all sort of generally creative and generally about spreading um uh hope and and connecting people i guess it's kind of a connective thread of all of it so yeah that's what i do that's great um and, and do you want to say a little bit what how you kind of got into the world of storytelling as a kind of pro like professional and personal endeavor yeah um it's interesting uh, when i look back at my life i i you know, at the time that I was doing all of the things that I was doing, none of them, they all seemed very disconnected from each other. But now with the with the perspective of distance and looking back, I can see how they're related. So um, first of all, my dad growing up was a pastor. So I grew up in church and um, I grew up and he was a great storyteller and loved to tell jokes, um, really silly jokes too, you know, like, <laughs> like one of his favorite jokes was, um, he would go, what's, uh, green and has red wheels and you go I don't know and you go grass I lied about the red wheels I'm like dad you're a pastor you're not supposed to lie <laughs> so um but yeah so I grew up in this church um that was kind of a a, a kind of a boundary breaking multicultural multi-ethnic church um in the in the early 90s when that wasn't really as much of a thing um and so I, I really started, um, I started writing when I was in college and, but I was always inspired by other people's stories. And then as I learned more about the Bible through doing worship music, and I kind of learned more about the overarching story. A lot of people think the Bible is just a book, but it's, it's closer to like a library of books. And so there are all these different stories from different authors over, over long, long periods of time. And piecing it together was kind of part of how I began to understand the value of story as an overarching principle. Um, kind of like in the same way that now, you know, the, the kids who grew up on like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you know, and they can like see, oh, it's like this, you know, at first it was, it was, it was Iron Man, but then it was Captain America, but then they became this thing, and then they they brought in all these people, and then it was a whole. So there's. I mean, not that I'm equating Marvel in the Bible, but just to say that, like, that was a part of my um, upbringing is the introduction, the introduction of stories um, as song. And then, you know, in my kind of teenage, like, junior high and teenage years, I, I also saw that, you know, in the advent of hip hop, when hip hop became this dominant force in American storytelling, it was because there were primarily black and brown people who were using the tools they had at their disposal to tell the stories about what was happening in their communities. Mm -hmm. You know, like one of the most seminal hip hop songs is called uh, The Message. And, you know, it says, don't push me, I'm close to the edge. It's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. So I was kind of in that stew of like, of, of urban storytelling and living amongst the people who are kind of in some ways on the margins of society because I grew up black, you know, in Portland. Yeah. Um, but also understanding the power of story and how it can also bring people together. 
And mm-hmm. so over time, you know, I did a lot of freelancing and did a lot of church work. And then kind of my freelancing turned into some more higher placement uh, things. And then I ended up because of the connection to the denomination that I grew up in, um, I ended up just working for them full time because uh, I had been freelancing in their magazine for many, many years. And they already knew me and they already liked my writing. And um, and it was actually something that happened because of the pandemic. So I work remotely. Our, our denomination is based in Chicago. And so, but when the pandemic happened and a bunch of positions went remote, and they were like, hey, would you consider doing this? You wouldn't have to move. And I was like, you had me, at, you don't have to move. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of where I am today. Great. Thanks for, thanks for sharing all that. I appreciate that. Um, so the next question, um, uh, this year's reconference theme is renewal. How do you practice self-renewal, self-care in your work and moments where when progress seems difficult or uphill, what renews your commitment to that work? So um, it's interesting being a creative person because sometimes there's a very fine line as a creative between recreation and work. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a blessing. I don't mean to, I don't mean to complain. I know that there's a lot of people who, you know, they love to do poetry or they love to do music, but their, their day job is, you know, something that's completely unrelated to that. And so I, um, I try to remind myself of how fortunate I am to be able to work from home and to do these kinds of creative, passionate things as part of my work. Um, but, but one of the things that does happen is that when you are doing creative work for your main job, um, then that thing can start to feel like a job. And so then I feel like I've been blessed to have a lot of different interests so that Anytime I get too overburdened um, by one thing, I can like switch to something else. And so um, there's music that I create that's apart from the music that I do at church, that's apart from my day job, that's just what I do to uh, express myself. Uh, And it's a combination of hip hop and gospel and pop and different forms. And so that's one of the things that I do that is refreshing for me. It's just a process of of creating and and relating kind of my um, my thoughts and feelings and kind of putting them into music. That's that's something that's um, very regenerating for me. Um, but I, I've also been challenged to, and I think the older that I get, the more I find value in this, um, to also uh, embrace silence and to have times of solitude, um, which sounds weird because I work from home by myself most of the time so you would think that solitude would be an easy thing but it's actually really hard when you're hyper connected and you're on social media all the time and i'm reading the news and all of the like i have to stay very hyper connected in order to do my job well but what it means is that it's hard for me to fully disconnect and fully be at rest um and so um i found that even um taking walks uh even you know like for me an ideal walk time is about between 30 and 40 minutes, but even if I only have 10 minutes uh, to just get up out of my chair uh, and walk for 10 minutes or or to find intentionality in doing regular, um, you know, domestic tasks like, oh, I, I have to I have to put the laundry away. Right. And so I could be like, I don't feel like putting the laundry away. But in my mind, I go, oh, hey, you know what? Putting my laundry away is a good time for me to move my body and stop thinking about what I'm doing here. Mm-hmm. And so. Uh, I find rest and rejuvenation sometimes in being very intentional about doing some of the things that I already do, but with purpose and, um, and with a different mindset. And so, for example, sometimes if I'm not creating music, sometimes I will um, put on some of my favorite music and instead of just listening to it while I'm doing dishes or whatever, um, I might just put on some headphones and sit and listen and do nothing else. And, um, you know, it's surprising how much, how ubiquitous music is to in all the different arenas that we are, you know, you hear it in restaurants and it's part of TV and video games and all that. But it's interesting what happens when you can actually just focus all your attention on it. That itself is a very uh, focusing uh, thing. And so, so being able to kind of pull from all these elements of my toolkit, um, that's part of how I, I practice a self care. And, um, and when progress, you know, the other, the other half of the question, you know, when progress seems difficult or uphill, mm-hmm. um, what renews my commitment to, to the work is the people that I'm connected to. Mm-hmm. 
So um, I'm blessed to be able to tell stories of hope. Um, and so I sometimes literally what motivates me is the fact that I've met this person and I know their story and it's so amazing and I just want other people to know it. And so that that's more motivation than just, well, I've got this task on my thing and my boss is going to get on my case if I don't get it done. Um, and I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm part of a faith community, why I go to church. There are people that I want to see. There are people that I know want to see me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, you know, I think just in general, the idea reminding myself that I am loved, that I'm loved by God, but I'm also loved by my wife and by other members of my family and people in my community, um, helps, helps to restore my own internalized sense of value that I'm not just loved for what I do. I'm not just loved for what I can bring to the table, but for who I am. And that kind of takes the pressure off a little bit. And then allows me to recalibrate and decide, okay, well, what's, you know, now, now that I'm loved just being myself, <laughs> what's the most important thing that I need to do? And, and, and do I, you know, it kind of frees me from having to like grab for affirmation, if that makes sense. Yeah. I appreciate that, that, that the, your connection to people is what kind of keeps you going, even though it may seem difficult to make progress in what you're trying to achieve. Um, it's like we're doing it for each other. So I appreciate that. Absolutely, Thank you. Yeah. Community is very important. We, we believe that at neighborhood partnerships too a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, next question is what is a common misconception about the field that you work in and how do you work to address it? Um, gosh, there are so many. Well, first of all, there's so many fields that I work in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like pick one, but um, <laughs> I would say one common misconception about, I'll just say being a religious leader. Cause I think sometimes, you know, when people hear that I'm a, you know, a worship pastor or that I, that I used to be a pastor full time or whatever, they kind of feel like, they kind of feel like they can't come to me and be their authentic self about what's going on. Like, you know, like sometimes people will say, you know, they'll cuss me like, Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot you were a Christian or something. And it's like, they have this misconception that to be a Christian means to be completely withdrawn from or completely above, you know, day-to-day -day drama. Um, and, and every time someone behaves like that, I just want to be like, hey, have you actually read the Bible? There's some crazy stuff in the Bible. <laughs> like, there's some people going through some drama. There's murder and there's people being unjustly uh, thrown in jail and there's, you know, ritual sacrifice and there's jealousy, backfighting. And so um, I, I feel like I, I address it by just being my most honest self and giving people permission to be their most honest selves. Mm. Uh, one other misconception I'll say is um, as a stand up, so stand-up isn't a huge part of what I do, but it's one of the things I love to do the most. And um, I wrote a book about my stand-up journey, my journey into doing stand-up, um, and it's called Undercover Profits. And there's a <laughs> chapter in the book that talks about, um, the, the title is Stop Trying to Be Funny. Um, and what I learned over time is that there are people who have this idea of comedy that, like, there are funny people and not funny people. And if you want to be good at comedy, you have to become a funny person and you have to do funny stuff. And what I've learned over time is that the people that we consider to be the funniest are really just most comfortable being who they are. Mm. Uh, they're, they, they have no, um, no artifice, no um, pretense about who they are. They just say it how it is. And, and, you know, sometimes that's shocking because, you know, because people use shocking language or whatever but most of the time it's just because everyone's story is valuable and so what i tell people is instead of trying to be funny um a better approach is to try to show me the funny that you discover like we all laugh at things we all have funny moments in our life mm -hmm. and so part of the skill of a comedian is being able to like take that funny moment that funny idea and translate it for me, as someone who wasn't there, who doesn't know the people that you know, or who, you know, didn't get to see the thing that you, the funny thing that you saw, and help help bring me into your world in that moment. 
And so then it takes the pressure off because it's not about trying to conjure up something that you don't have, but it's more of just like, bring me into your story. Tell me who the players are. Tell me, like, you know, make that funny voice that your mom makes when she reminds you to stop, you know, opening the oven to check on the cookies or whatever it is. So that's a misconception. And I, again, in the same way as the other thing, I, I try to uh, dispel it by being my most honest self and encouraging people to be their most honest selves. And as we learn to do that, we, we often find connections with each other that we didn't know we had because some of the, as adults, some of the ways that we maintain a image of competency and professionalism or middle-classness or, you know, whatever kind of label you want to throw on it. Um, we don't realize that those things uh, are barriers in our ability to connect. Mm. And when we get those barriers down and we see that we're all people just trying to figure stuff out the best we can, then we go, oh, yeah, I've had that problem. Or, oh, that's just like this. And then, you know, before you know it, we're connecting, we're vibing. And just to out of curiosity, do you feel like that's something you try to practice in some of your writing and your storytelling as well as to try to t bring down those barriers so people can be yeah. more connect with you as a person and see yeah. past kind of the stereotypes or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and it's, it's a dance mm -hmm. too because so for example, um, in my stand up, sometimes I can be confrontational, but I try not to do it in a way that makes people feel bad but in a way that kind of shows them a different way of looking at something. So um, I have a bit where I talk about um, how I don't love the phrase low hanging fruit because, um, you know, people use that phrase in business environments to think, to, to mean, let's go after the easy thing. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I hear someone say that, I just want to be like, Hey, Hey, have you ever actually spent time picking low hanging fruit? <laughs> Cause it's actually backbreaking labor. I think what you meant to say was, let's go after the eye level snacks in the Walgreens checkout line. That's what you meant to say. <laughs> so now that joke, like, I mean, hopefully I, 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 I hope that people find it funny. But what I'm really trying to communicate is that the phrases and the words that we use matter. Mm -hmm. And we may um, unintentionally offend someone by, by using terminology that's outside of our experience. If you've never actually picked low hanging fruit, it doesn't occur to you that calling it easy may be an insult for someone who that is their job. And it is not, in fact, easy. Uh, so uh, there are all these little ways that I try to do that. And it, and it requires some humility on my part to be a learner. Um, and it also requires a delicate touch, right? Because no one goes, goes to a comedy show to be lectured to about the, <laughs> the geopolitical realities of, of you know, the food chain and like all this stuff. So it's like, how do we do that in a way that still feels natural and fun, but that someone could walk away and go, huh, I didn't know that. All right. Mm. Cool. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that example too. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Our next question is, can you share a recent success or breakthrough in your work that energized you? Um, I don't know if this is cheating, but I, I feel like being invited to this conference was a breakthrough for me. Um, this conference, there's also another conference that I'm going to be, um, doing also in the uh, month of October, um, by, uh, it's for CCDA, which is a Christian community development association. And it's it, it really, it's interesting. It's kind of, it's almost like the, the faith based version of neighborhood partnerships. Um, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's been going on. Well, I don't know how long neighborhood partnerships have been going on, but it's been going on. A really long time and so it's kind of a prestigious conference in the world of like faith-based justice activism mm. uh, i don't know if you're familiar with um a man named john perkins um but he's a legendary uh christian activist like he marched with dr king and all this kind of stuff so mm. he started ccda you know many decades ago and it moves around from city to city and this year it just happens to be in portland mm. and so i was invited to be there so um being able to present and do music and do comedy and spaces like that. Um, that's a huge breakthrough for me just because most of the work that I do is not in groups. It's not in front of people. It's writing, it's behind a screen or it's making a video and like 
you know, you may see you may see numbers that indicate that people clicked on it, but it's not mm -hmm. the same thing as being in front of an audience or or being in front of a group of people and sharing your story. So um, that's that's a great privilege for me, and I'm and I'm really excited about it. Great. Um, well, we're glad to have you. <laughs> um, so uh, last the last question is uh, just how do you see the landscape of racial housing and economic justice in Oregon evolving, and what role does your work play in that evolution? Well. You know, it's interesting. Um, I see it evolving kind of on two levels, right? I see it evolving from the like big picture, uh, you know, the view from like 30,000 feet when I'm reading the news and I'm hearing about mm -hmm. policies and, um, you know, every election cycle when there's different politicians trying to make different elements of these issues as part of their platform and so it's been interesting and exciting to see um how some of some of these justice issues that you know previously seemed really kind of extreme and lefty like super crunchy lefty you know 15 20 years ago now like i think about um uh the fight for 15 in mm -hmm. um you know minimum wage and how a decade ago that was kind of a pipe dream and now it's it's the reality in a lot of places and um and in the places where it isn't there's significant political pressure to do that so i see that on that level and that's cool but then i also experience it um person to person mm -hmm. um and i think that combination is really exciting and humbling for me um you know like i have um i used to live in hillsboro and I have a, a friend who was one of our neighbors at this apartment complex in Hillsboro. And, and when I lived out there, I didn't, my wife and I, we didn't really forge a lot of close relationships because most of the people who were there were kind of just in and out and they didn't really talk to you and whatever. It just kind of wasn't really our scene. But um, I found out that this neighbor, she and her working class husband, like, you know, neither one of them made a ton of money. Um, I think they were both working retail jobs when we met them. Um, they're moving into their own house this weekend because of their connection with Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. And um, and hearing them talk about it in the abstract and now seeing their Facebook updates and like talking about how excited they are and, and the work they put into it. Um, it's a blessing to see that that kind of thing really does change lives. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've, I actually myself wrote a song uh, a couple years ago about my frustration with uh, with the real estate market and how there was a time when I was trying to figure out where I was going to move next. Uh, this is when we were still out in Hillsboro and I was trying to figure out where could I move back into the city of Portland and it didn't feel like it was um, it didn't feel like it was accessible to me because the prices, the rental prices were so crazy. And then I got connected to the IDA program and mm -hmm. we, you know, took the home buyers class. And so we, we are on track to be able to purchase our first home. And so that for me, like seeing my friends go through it, being able to go through it myself, uh, it really changes my perspective from just looking at it purely from an abstract or from a political point of view of what's going to animate people to like, think about like how is this going to change my life mm -hmm. um and i'm really grateful to be able to be in a place where there are those kinds of resources um and and even even if those resources weren't available to me right now just to know that there's a community of people who are working on solutions who are brainstorming who are trying to stand up with one another and and stand up for one another that um you know that the that the that the labor movement in Portland is very strong, and mm. um, you know even though sometimes strikes can be inconvenient, but they are a sign of people banding together and saying we feel like this is what we need, and we're going to stand up and try to get what we need. Uh, knowing people who are part of that movement, and not just reading about it in the paper, but hearing firsthand from people who are involved, um, that's really animating to me. Mm -hmm. And that helps me to um, feel like I have a role in it, even if I'm not the guy who's like 
holding signs or whatever at the picket line or whatever, um, or if it's not a labor issue, but, you know, even though I'm not doing what, what people would consider activist work, but being able to bring some of those sensibilities to the art that I create and to the work that I do, um, you know, as well, like, here's a good example. So in my day job, um, again, I'm, I'm working primarily writing to a Christian audience for a church denomination. But uh, just this morning, I wrote this article about the new movie Sing Sing, which I don't know if you've seen it, but it's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's this movie about um, about uh, inmates in uh, what's called the uh, RTA, the Rehabilitation Through the Arts Program at the maximum security uh, prison in upstate New York called Sing Sing. Mm -hmm. And so what's, and, and, and it's, you know, when you hear about it at first, it's like, oh, okay, that sounds like inspiring and whatever. But then you find out that most of the actors in the film are actually formerly incarcerated people who learn to act through that program. Mm. And so they're not creating a story as much as they are reenacting their, their lived experience. And so me being able to write about that to a Christian audience to say like, this is some of the hope that's, <clears throat> that's coming out of our prison systems. I think it's really necessary when, when people are fed a media diet of, you know, stories about prisoners that that reinforce these stereotypes about them being dangerous and 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 like you know all this crazy stuff and and you hear someone who has a, a a felony record and you feel like oh I can't let them you know be around my children or something be able to counter that narrative with really arresting art that that connects to a real issue that connects to issues around not just mass incarceration but but issues around um, around uh, like worker eligibility and what does it mean to re-enter society and try to um, get back in and like all of that kind of stuff for me to be able to write about that from my vantage point to me that's that's part of how change happens right mm -hmm. i'm not an activist but i'm sure that there's somebody who's going to read this article who's you know they're not going to read mother jones or you know some other you know what they would consider lefty source but because I'm speaking to it from the perspective of a Christian who believes what's in the Bible, they can be like, oh, OK. And they see it in a different way. So that's kind of the role that I play. And I'm grateful to be able to do it. Great. Um, well, thank you for sharing all that. Is there anything else that you want to add uh, in addition to what, what we've already talked about? Um, just uh, if you want to know more about my book, uh, you can find it at uh, my website, jelanagreenish.com. It's called Undercover Profits. And uh, I'm biased, but I think it's a pretty good read. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, uh, every, we'll look forward to seeing you at the conference in October. All right. Right on. Thank you. Thank you. Um...